So my, my concern is, I didn't see uh, mathematicians in high school being good at it. And my suspicion when I got to college is it would be worse in college. I didn't test that suspicion out because <laughs> during the 60s, all requirements were reduced. I took nothing but sociology, psychology, and philosophy courses uh, to get my PhD. But Sixia and Walter and perhaps Lloyd, could you help us think about what are the c concrete ways we can help African Americans, Latinos, low income students who are first generation understand what this all means for them, the possibilities that are, that are exciting for them, as opposed to what they now experience oftentimes is wading through very abstract kinds of exercises that it's not clear where they're going to lead. But Americans in general, because it's not even just those groups. Well, typical American middle class. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, is not, so it's, it's, this is one of those times when whatever would work with one group would work with all groups as we think about it. Yeah, well, I am, um, I'm sitting here both excited and challenged because I'm thinking, wow, I, I, was, I was definitely one of those kids sitting there in algebra trying to figure out why am I going to use this? Is this going to really help me make money? I mean, my mother is working in a factory. My dad's not here, and I have to figure out what to do. So in high school, it didn't mean anything to me. That and my algebra teacher was on crack. The reason why I knew was because my friend was selling crack to him. And he got an A and I got a C. So um, I was like, oh really? Oh, is that the way algebra works? I don't know. So um, sure, I, I, I can sit here and, and, and I can tell you that if you want to understand math, it needs to be close to you. And what do I mean by that? That means that you have to have some motivating factor. What inspires you to understand math? What is your passion? Why are you doing this? So my motivating factor for, let's say, trying to understand algebra, or at least trying to get a C, well, I, I did get a C, um, was because of my grandmother. And, um, and, and she raised me because my mother was working all the time. And so that for me was important to me. And I did everything that I could to understand what it took to graduate from high school and then move on to college. Uh, and then eventually work at Harvard and, and do some work there. And I'm thinking, wow, I'm doing all of this for what? Oh yeah, that's right, because I need a paycheck. But no, I'm doing this for my grandmother. And I think that we lose sight of what our story is. I think that because we focus on all of the many challenges that we have, um, where we do lack a, a certain skill, and that is a, a, it's, it's a very, very important listening skill, but there's something else that I feel that we should understand, and that's how to tell a good story. And that's both at an individual level and at an institutional level. My job is I help people start and grow businesses all the time, so I have the privilege of understanding what their passions are, what motivates them, what what are their visions of the world? And I think that asking ourselves that simple question, what is our story, and sitting down in front of somebody else who is able to help you get to where you need to be, then that makes it all worthwhile. It's meaningful, right? So as I deal with, um, with different people within the business world, the thing that I do best is I help them put their story down on paper, and then I help them make money from that story. And there's three things that I focus on, and, uh, and, and I embrace them because I've used them to get out of the inner city and do what, I, what I've done in my life, and so I, I won't get into my biography, but um, it's the first thing, which is vision. Having a clear and concrete vision of where you're going. The second thing is, what's your strategy? How do you plan on getting there? And it could be as simple as steps. Here are three strategic ways that I know will help me get to the next level. And the last part, and I think that it's probably the most um, foundational and most functional part, and it's also the area that we lack most, and that's execution. We can sit here all day, we can read the newspaper, and we can talk about all the problems in the past, but very, very, little of that time is spent in actually acting on it. And I feel that everybody wants progress. We all want to see positive outcomes. We all want positive economic development. We just don't understand what the story is. And as soon as we understand, 
tell me what those action items are because I want to help. Let me give you, I think she's asking, by the way, I want to hire you. Just, uh, it, it is so important to think about, uh, there's a book by Bossidy, it's entitled Execution, How to Get Things Done. And my campus has used it for several years as a Bible because it really does focus on specificity, data-driven decision-making, opportunities for people to look at the strategies to see what's working, starting with the pilot group, learning from that, and then making it systemic. Now, in the foundation that I chair, the board I chair, or what we do at Marguerite Casey, is very similar in the sense that uh, it goes back to something that Warren said earlier. We often have grants or whatever for several years. We do something and then the money runs out and we stop doing it. Well, on both levels, for, for the university, we realized that producing minority scientists in a predominantly white right setting was so rare that if we took our own money and invested millions of dollars into this effort, we could pull in more money, quite frankly, because nobody can do it. So we now have people coming from all over the country trying to figure out how do you get more blacks and Hispanics to do so well? They can become MDs, MD, PhDs. So it's a part of the fabric of the place. It's a part of our DNA now. Inclusive <coughs> excellence, right? Second, and, and a part of that was getting faculty, most of whom are white, to buy into figuring out how they get it into the labs, inspire them, push them, kick their butt if they're not doing well, have the kind of strong relationship that they can be really rigorous in the analysis. It works well. At the foundation, working with families and children, after you listen to what families say, we actually organized 10,000 families called Equal Voices in several years. And we had exercises in, we had three cities where we, we brought people together. From the Deep South, we had it in Birmingham, and I spoke. We had it in Chicago, we had it in LA. We had large numbers of people of color, Hispanics and Blacks, Native Americans, and New England whites. And we asked them, what are your issues? What are the problems? And we went through all of that, and we worked to teach them how you take the issues, and then you dissect to see what can be done, and then you look at the groups that might be involved. And most important, we said, rather than just talking about grants for a few, let's take some cornerstone organizations who are our partners. And for us, partnership men, we decided we're marrying these places. We will work with them to make sure we agree on what they're going to achieve in the next five years. And when they achieve it and things are going well, we'll keep funding them as we help them to leverage the money. It has to be a long term, not a multi year. Three years, five years won't do it. To have transformation, you have to have the activity become systemic in the sense that it's a part, again, of the DNA of the community, of the organization. These are the things <coughs> we will do for the next 20 years. So if, for example, you want to ask the question, has there ever been a Latino kid out of Providence who has become a PhD in science? You know, and, and maybe they wanted to, who are those people? You start there, you know. And then just, this is this one specific project I'm talking about. How do we produce more Hispanic Latino scientists, right, from the community? You've got to start by saying, well, what have we done so far? How do we listen to those who have made a few, you know, one, two percent? And then how do we build, start with the program, with the idea, though, that what you learn from that program, you'll then make into a systemic initiative in a K-12 setting with the community, with some college where you're doing it, and let the numbers build that way. And if, the reason we started with wanting to get PhDs and MD PhDs was, if that's the goal, I, I keep using the Browning quote, oh, that a man's reach should exceed his grasp, or what's a heaven for? If you make that the goal, then the kid who gets the masters is thinking, I didn't do enough. But that kid is a great job as a professional. That kid, and then the same thing at the bachelor's level and then the two-year degree level. And so I would argue that systemic execution, starting with a group to see what's possible, and moving to the next level, it's amazing how much can be accomplished. Uh, but understanding that the partnership is not a three-year grant, it is about a long-term commitment. If you can do these things, we'll keep funding you while you work to leverage funds to get some more. You'll have that partnership with the, with the university. You ask the college or the university to put in some of its money to work with that, and you move from there. Let me turn to Walter, you know, turn to Lloyd, to push on this vision issue. Because again, while I respect our academic colleagues, I'm fearful that their vision is informed by the disciplines yes. more than it is by often the reality of how these skills are going to be employed in the community in various ways. So could you talk a little bit, Walter, from your experience? And Lloyd, what, what, what else do we need to add to our vision? <coughs> I'm actually in the private sector, but, but I, I think that the, uh, the the business of learning is a challenge, whether or not you're in the public sector or the private sector. But I think that the big determination, or the big determinant of success, has to do with the level of building a relationship and engagement at a practitioner level. Mm -hmm. 
your surely was always excited about math. It happened on two fronts. One, uh, my parents made it tremendously fun. We used to drive in New York around, and our own license plate was 3Q9182. And we would see other license plates, and you had to solve for Q or for X or for R. <laughs> and then Max Edelman, who was my middle school math teacher, who, won, who, who wore a bow tie like this, the colony here, <laughs> made math so much fun that everybody got it. And it just became kind of the way that we spoke. Um, and so that's important. I think practitioners are important to the extent that you can build systems that help you in terms of the selection <coughs> process of the right people, right. and then institutionally be able to bring the right, build the right support structures mm -hmm. to support those practitioners mm -hmm. in a healthy environment so they can be a good relationship development, a good level of engagement, you will have levels of success. I think the challenge today, when we think about academia, whether or not you're in kindergarten, or whether or not you're in graduate school, is to look at, at least what we've seen in the private sector, is the importance of technology and the role that it is playing in terms, and can play in terms of building those relationships and levels of engagement, and also prepare, preparing them in terms of, as, um, as, as Freeman had talked about, in terms of what's to come in the 21st century. Here's a, here's a wonderful example. There is a, um, and we've had a chance to do some work here with uh, Hillary Passa, building the 13, 19 year olds. Uh, school, uh, we helped create uh, this notion of a virtual advisor. So you could you could put information into a computer about a little bit about who you were, what you were thinking about, and this virtual advisor could help you think about what's possible. Mm -hmm. We've talked to we've talked to in parts of our research we've done, we've seen in middle school where people are using Facebook and MySpace in classes to do work to learn about Abraham Lincoln. Create a page, a Facebook page for Abraham Lincoln that allows the teacher to be able to relate and engage a child in terms of kind of where they're living today. So I think that to the extent that you can find those kinds of examples, celebrate them. If there's a way that you could, uh, earlier Freeman had just talked about, if you find the exceptional PhD minority candidate for the math, make those visible examples and build off of those successes. Oftentimes, one of the things we've observed here at Rhode Island is that there's a lot of good stuff going on here. We need to lead with those kinds of stories more so than the other stories. And I think those, those could be the, the, the appropriate path to success. And certainly for a, a state that has got the strong label of hope, I think it's an important part of it. Um, I want to address uh, one of the uh, Freeman's um, observations. Um, uh, I, I want to start by uh, telling you a, a, a Rhode Island story. And um, uh, I am a professor of biology, and so I have specialized in the teaching of first-year students for the past 25 years, just first-year students. And I don't think that higher education in Rhode Island uh, does enough to find out why students are unsuccessful in college. Yes. And that's a really important issue. So I, I had um, a class a few years ago, and um, there were a lot of students from a very preeminent um, uh, charter school. All of them were on the dean's list in the fall, and they came to my class, and none of them were going to pass, so I asked them all to drop the course. And uh, in the summer, I took all of them on. I offered them a workshop course, How to Succeed in Science. Uh, and then, uh, I followed through, I went to the, their schools, I talked to their principals, I talked to their teachers, uh, and it took me to this school uh, called Times Square. It's a charter school, it's all minority, uh, and they've done, we've done, the school has done exceptionally well. And uh, uh, one of the students is now, uh, whose father was from the Dominican Republic, came to this country, wanted to do, offer his family a better life, uh, was a dentist because of the problem of language. He's a janitor, but his son wanted to be a dentist, and he's going to dental school in the fall. Um, but back to, this, to the issue of um, uh, Times Square, uh, which um, has a program which touched on what you said, which I think is very, very important, 
we have a program to reach out to families. Uh, we even have people, for students who, are in problem, who have problems, someone will go to the family's home and talk to someone. And uh, we invite parents to our board meetings. We invite them to uh, whatever academic activity there is, we always invite the parents. And, and not all the parents come all the time, but we do have parents who show their interest in whatever is going on. And so, uh, as a result of that, I became, I'm on the board for Times Square, I'm the chair of the Education Committee, and we push very heavily uh, for familial involvement. And that has, I think that's one of the keys to success. And I think there's been several people who've mentioned um, uh, a grandmother or someone in the family uh, providing that impetus for success. And I think that that connection it is certainly an important uh, uh, underpinning for success for uh, minority students and uh, for STEM education. But I think that um, one of the paradigm shifts that have to, has to occur is, is the idea that we have in this country that <coughs> the best educational system that students um, need to be trained at a certain level so they can go out and get a job or get into college. Well, I was in China a, a, week, a couple weeks ago, and I was the host of a family, and their fifth, year, fifth grade, 11-year-old <coughs> daughter um, uh, was <coughs> uh, is in school and is doing great appropriate things, but the culture, the culture of that country, of that city, yeah. um, uh, the family's push, so, on Saturdays, 8 to 12, she goes to school to study English. She goes to Sunday school, 8 to 12, and she studies mathematics. And this fifth year, I, I wanted to see her homework. So I looked at her homework, and this 11-year-old girl is doing, um, solving complex parallelogram angle problems. Yes. And uh, so she's in plain geometry. By the time she's done with middle school, she'll be done with calculus. But, but the purpose of that education is not to uh, develop any kind of academic skills, but merely to give the student a background so that when they reach the appropriate level and reach that grade level, they, can, they will already have a facility with that particular discipline. And so the paradigm shift that we need to have in this country is that we need to educate parents that our, the education of our children is not for the United States, it's for the global marketplace and the people of Japan, South Korea, China, and India understand this. And we need, to, we need to educate our parents. And I think that's where a major paradigm shift has to occur. I have to tell you that it's, I mean, he's so right. I, I spent a lot of time in China. In fact, the big joke about UBC is it stands for you must be Chinese. About 27 percent. Grad students come in from Beijing Institute of Technology. I've got a lot of kids in the Indian Institute of Technology. And what's interesting is, uh, and it was said by white kids who were upset when they were getting in, and some of the Chinese American kids were. And I said, well, yeah, we do have a lot. It means we're like Berkeley. It's a wonderful thing. We love it, right? Because you learn from other people, other cultures. But you're absolutely right about the attitude. I, I'll never forget, I spent five years in a um, uh, collaboration with people in Japan and Germany, uh, and I was representing American education, and it was on, the idea was on competition. And it was very interesting that I was studying a, a Japanese mothers and their children. Now, one child might grasp concepts like this. The next child might take more time. Now, in America, that says to the American mother, well, this is the math person, this is the other. The Japanese mother said, no, they will both get it. One just takes more time, it's okay. They'll get it, they'll get the eight. The expectation was still, People learn at different rates. My mother always told teachers, he'll get it fast, but he'll forget it fast. If you, you, know, you know, some people learn it fast, but sometimes when you don't take time to really struggle with it, you can memorize it and say, whatever. That's why I got the worst grades in my mother's class. She knew how to give me it. She would trick me because I could just memorize and get it. She, she wasn't tricking me. She was trying to push me to stop dazzling me with my memory and rather learn how to think, you see. And teachers are always impressed. Think about this when somebody can give them back exactly what they said. I've got more people say, brilliant. It's because I repeat word for word what the teacher said. The teacher didn't even realize it was her words, right? But teaching them to think is the difference. And then the point about family, one of my mentors in, in T's in, in DC has a company that we are, we're supporting it by Marjorie Casey. It's on teach, a, it's called Concentric, Concentric. And it's focused on teaching teachers how to go to the homes 
of inner city families in D.C. and Detroit and other places, and how to, first of all, how not to make that grandmother or somebody feel uncomfortable, how not to seem like you're being judgmental, how to learn how to listen and ask questions. And the first goal, and you appreciate this, is just to get kids, to get that grandmother or mother to understand if the child isn't in school, the child cannot possibly do well. Because you see in, in minority situations, large numbers of attendance problems. And when the kid has missed so many days, it's over. It really is. And so teaching teachers, giving them the opportunity to go to the family, <coughs> right, right, because a lot of families will not come in, and how to respectfully have a conversation with them and not judge them is a major accomplishment. You go, you have a middle class person going and seeing a, a place that looks really bad, yet there's a big TV and, and, the, and the person shows the disdain for the values where the person just doesn't know any better, but that's what it is. And amazingly, people can tell when you're not really approving of how they live. And so helping teachers and counselors understand how to have effective home visits with an outcome, number one, of having the attendance improve, and number two, having the, the family member willing to talk to somebody about what's going on, and number three, helping the kid believe that the parent and the teacher are on the same page. You know, one of the things my books found that was that many parents will take the child's side or point of view and complain about the teacher with the child. It's the worst thing a parent can do. Because if the kid feels that he can get his mother against his teacher, he's going to do that. Any kid would. You know, so even if a, teach, a parent has a problem with the teacher, not letting that kid know it and respecting and supporting that teacher is the best thing that a, a parent can do for a child. And many people just don't understand that.